Lucy. Act One. Chapter One. As the sun rose over Bloomville, a distant trumpet began to play. Doodly doodly doo. The notes drifted to the streets, past the shops, down the alley where the little dog slept, and into her dreams. And then a car door slammed. She was awake now. And she was off, past Bertolt's butcher shop, past the diner with the questionable scraps. No time for one-eyed cat in the window or the silly pigeons in the park. Around the corner with the fire hydrant across the street, down the block and up the steps of the apartment building with the red door. She sat. Chapter two. Inside the apartment building with the red door, Eleanor Wish opened the old steamer trunk. She pushed aside the baseball glove, the box of chalk, and her father's snow globe collection, and took out a ball of string. She hugged her father goodbye as she rushed to get, as he rushed to get ready for work, and took the ball of string into her room. Tying the end of the string around a bit of sausage, she had sneaked from her breakfast. She leaned out her window. She unwound the string, and down went the sausage, lower and lower, to the little dog waiting below. Chapter 3 As he was leaving for work, Sam Wish noticed that the old steamer trunk had been left open. He went to close it when, next to the baseball glove and box of chalk, he saw his snow globe collection. He took out the Paris globe and watched the snow swirl around the tiny Eiffel Tower. Then, taking all the snow globes into his arms, he threw Paris into the air. Next, he threw London, and then Tokyo, Istanbul, and Cairo, all the places he dreamed of someday seeing. They circled around him in perfect order. He was juggling. He sat on the edge of the dining room table and closed his eyes. He was still juggling. <coughs> he lay down and was still juggling. He moved from room to room, eyes closed, while the globes circled through the air in perfect order. Suddenly, he heard the cuckoo clock. He was late for work. He packed the snow globes in his juggling case, grabbed his keys, stepped outside, and nearly tripped over the little dog sitting at his door. Chapter 4. After breakfast, the little dog roamed the streets of Bloomville. She chased the pigeons in the park. She barked at the one-eyed cat. And when the sun was high in the sky and concrete sidewalks grew hot, she retreated to the shady doorway of Harry's barbershop for a nap. There in her dream, she remembered her former life. She is on the hunt, prowling down long halls and into quiet bedrooms. She searches balconies and verandas and behind curtains and cabinets and vases. She lies in wait under the dining room table. And she surveys the unused study from atop the tallest chair. Finally in defeat, she climbs up on a soft couch and there, hiding behind the cushion, her elusive prey. Her stuffed toy cat. Chapter 5. Sam had arrived late for work, and his boss was not pleased. So he quickly unpacked crates, and he carefully stocked shelves, and he did not juggle. Until his boss stepped outside. Chapter 6. Eleanor placed a quarter on the counter at Enzo's Deli. 
and Enzo handed her a cheese sandwich and her change, a nickel. Eleanor took her lunch and dropped the nickel into her pocket along with all the other nickels from previous lunches. On her way home, she saw Dahlia and Daisy on their afternoon walk with Ms. Del Rio. And she said hello to Bailey and Ms. Pennington. She blew a kiss to Henry, the Labrador, who kept watch over the neighborhood from his third floor apartment. Eleanor thought about what she would call the little dog she gave breakfast to if the little dog were hers. Probably, Lu probably Lucy, she thought. Yes, Lucy. And where is Lucy now, she wondered. Chapter 7. As evening approached, Lucy positioned herself across the street from Bertolt's butcher shop. Miss Pennington ambled by on her last walk of the day with Bailey. and Ms. Del Rio strolled leisurely past with Dahlia and Daisy. Lucy sniffed a mailbox. She pretended to inspect a lamppost. Then she crossed the quiet street, and when the moment was right, Lucy made her move. In through the door of Bertolt's butcher shop, and out again in a flash. her prize bouncing along behind her. Chapter 8 By the time Sam arrived at the Palace Theater, the amazing Khan was already on stage. He performed the usual card tricks and pulled a rabbit from a hat, and the audience responded with a polite smattering of applause. But they gasped, as he sawed his lovely assistant in half, and they burst into thunderous applause when her lower half jumped up and danced across the stage. The amazing Khan looked, took a bow, and the curtain swung closed. Then it was Sam's turn. He took the snow globes from his juggling case as the curtain swung open again. He threw <clears throat> the Paris snow globe in the air, then London, Tokyo, Istanbul, and Cairo. The globes circled around him in perfect order. Then he looked out into the audience. Suddenly he was petrified. He felt dizzy, and his hands went numb. The Paris globe fell to the stage floor with a crack. Then London, Tokyo, Istanbul, and Cairo, one at a time, shattered all around him. The audience fell silent as a large hook reached out and pulled Sam from the stage. <clears throat> as he left the theater, he turned to see Umberto the Boneless Wonder tr tying himself into a knot. The audience applauded politely and the curtain swung closed. Act Two. Chapter One. The next morning, as the sun rose over Bloomville, a distant trumpet once again began to play. Doodly doodly do, followed by a trombone. Womp wah, womp wah. The notes lifted into the air and mingled among the treetops in the park then fell to the streets, drifting down the alley where Lucy slept and into her dreams. And then a car horn honked. She was awake now. <clears throat> and she was off, past Bertolt the angry butcher, past the diner with the questionable scraps, No time for the one-eyed cat in the window or the silly pigeons in the park. Around the corner with the fire hydrant and across the street, down the block and up the steps of the apartment building with the red door, she sat. Chapter 2. Inside the apartment building with the red door, Eleanor opened up the steamer trunk. She pushed aside the baseball glove and the box of chalk took out the ball of string, and closed the trunk. She hugged her father goodbye as he got ready for work. Then she took the ball of string into her room. She 
She tied the string around a bit of cheese saved from yesterday's lunch and leaned out her window. She unwound the string. Down went the bit of cheese, lower and lower, to the little dog waiting below. As she rolled the string back up, Eleanor smiled and waved to Dahlia and Daisy out on the morning walk with Ms. Del Rio. Chapter 3 Back inside the apartment, Sam cleared the dishes from the table, but he did not juggle them. Instead, he packed them in his juggling case. He stepped outside and scooted around the little dog at his door. He saw Ms. Del Rio approaching with something on her mind. Was she saying something about a window and a string? Sam did not wait around to find out. He would not be late today. Chapter 4 After breakfast, Lucy once again roamed the streets of Bloomville. She passed the homes of other dogs. Most were back inside now, napping on soft couches or chewing on treats. And when the sun was high in the sky and the concrete grew hot, she moved to the cool green grass of the park, where she curled up next to a shady bush for a nap. There in her dreams, Lucy remembered her former life. She is outside on a porch, lying upon a velvet tufted bench. She is guarding her stuffed toy cat. A suspicious looking bird flutters and hops closer and closer. Lucy barks and the bird flies away. She hears the jingle of a collar and rushes to find an unfamiliar dog snooping around the back gate. She barks and it runs away. She sees two sneaky squirrels creeping through the grass. She charges across the lawn and they scamper up a tree and disappear over a wall. Finally, with her rivals in retreat, Lucy returns to the porch to her prize, her stuffed toy cat. Chapter 5. For days, Sam Wish had been carefully constructing a display in front of the store, a tower of canned soup. As he started on a row of minestrone, he noticed the street was quiet and empty. He threw a can into the air, and then he threw another and another, until canned soup was circling around him in perfect order. And then... McGinty, the McGinty family, stepped around the corner. Sam felt dizzy and his hands went numb. Bum, bum, bum. Chapter 6 A dog should always have toys, thought Eleanor. So she s selected an armful of stuffed toys from a basket and placed them on the counter of Ms. Chee's pet shop. And as she counted out her leftover lunch money nickels, Ms. Chee placed the toys in a brown paper bag. On her way home, she saw the McGinty family in the park. She smiled as she watched Emily McGinty playing fetch with Scooter. And she laughed as she watched little Billy chase Rex around a tree. Or was Rex chasing Billy? All the while, she thought about Lucy, and she wondered where Lucy was now. Back on the street, she passed the store where her father worked. Canned soup was everywhere. Chapter 7 In the afternoon, as Lucy once again grew hungry, she passed by Bertolt's butcher shop. But Bertolt was guarding the door more closely than ever. She came across a few cans of soup in the street, but the cans were unopened. Everywhere she looked, there was food, but none of it was for her. And so she found herself in the alley behind the diner, sniffing some leftover scraps of food. These were questionable scraps. Very questionable. She ate them anyways. Chapter 8 Sam arrived at the Palace Theater just as the curtain opened on the Dixie Sisters. They played banjos and sang in three-part harmony, and the audience applauded politely. Chapter 9 
During their next number, they circled gracefully around the stage as they sped up and moved into a figure eight. Their dresses lifted just enough to reveal they were riding on unicycles. The crowd burst into thunderous applause. The curtain closed and Sam stepped on the stage. He opened his juggling case and took out the dishes. The curtain opened again. Taking a deep breath, Sam tossed a cup in the air. Next, he tossed a bowl followed by a glass, then another cup and another bowl. The dishes circled around him in perfect order. And then Sam looked out into the audience. Sam should blindfold himself. Suddenly he was petrified. He felt dizzy and his hands went numb. The first glass fell to the stage and shattered. Then the bowl shattered, followed by a cup, and then the other cup and the other bowl. The audience fell silent as once again the large hook reached out and pulled Sam from the stage. Poor Sam. As he left the theater, he turned to see one of Mr. B's fantastic fleas walking across a tightrope. The audience applauded politely, and then the curtains swung close. Act Three. Chapter One. The next morning, as the sun rose over Bloomville, a distant trumpet began to play. Doodly doodly doo, followed by a trombone. Womp wa, womp wa, and finally a double bass. Bump a bump, bump a bump. The notes rose upward and joined together as a beautiful as beautiful music among the rooftops and water towers, then fell gently to the trees, down the alley where Lucy slept and into her dreams, and then a car backfired. She was awake now. And she was off, past Bertolt's butcher shop, past the diner with the questionable scraps. No time for the one-eyed cat in the window or the silly pigeons in the park. Around the corner with the fire hydrant and across the street, down the block and up the steps of the apartment building with the red door. She sat. Chapter 2. Eleanor had noticed that her father's snow globe collection was missing, and she was aware, too, of their even ever-shrinking set of dishes. Her father needed to practice. He needed to practice in front of an audience. So now, instead of giving a bit of sausage in her pocket, giving the bit of sausage in her pocket, not to mention a new stuffed toy, to the little dog waiting downstairs, she was sitting patiently on the couch, an audience of one. She attempted an encouraging smile as her father returned from the kitchen with their few remaining dishes and began throwing them into the air. Around and around, the dishes went flying through the air in perfect order. And then, one at a time, the dishes came to rest in his hand. Eleanor applauded, and Sam took a bow. Chapter 3 Feeling emboldened, Sam Wish packed the dishes in his juggling case. Then he took some fruit from the kitchen in a brown paper bag filled with stuffed toys and packed... What? Then she took some fruit from the kitchen... Then he took some fruit from the kitchen and a brown paper bag filled with stuffed toys and packed it all in his juggling case. He said goodbye to his daughter and, being careful not to trip over the little dog at his door, stepped outside. But the little dog was not there. Chapter 4 And where was Lucy? She was roaming the streets of Bloomville, following anyone who looked like they might drop a donut or let a bit of strudel slip through their fingers. But no one did. So, when the sun was high in the sky and the sidewalks grew hot, she once again returned to the cool green park, where she curled up under a shady tree for a nap. There, in her dreams, Lucy remembered her former life. She's on a picnic, in a park, far away from home, and she's on the prowl again, searching for her stuffed toy cat. She searches inside a picnic basket and beneath the blanket. She searches in some nearby bushes and behind an old oak tree, but her elusive prey is nowhere to be found. Then she sees some pigeons pecking around the ground near the edge of the park. She, ch 
charges toward them, and they fly away, landing again a block up the street. She charges again, and again they fly away, and it is here that Lucy sees a most unusual sight. There, sitting in a window across the street, is a one-eyed cat. She crosses the street and barks at the cat, but it doesn't move. So she barks some more, and then a strange scent wafts by. Entranced, Lucy follows the peculiar smell down the street and around the corner, or two, or is it three? And on she walks, paying little attention to the shops, people, and dogs along the way. She slips through a hole in the fence, and there in an alley behind a diner is the source of the unusual odor, leftover scraps of food. She takes a big sniff. These are questionable scraps, very questionable. She eats them anyway. With a belly full, she slips back through the hole in the fence. The street is quiet and night is falling, and only then does she realize she's lost, completely and utterly, lo utterly lost. Chapter 5. While Lucy slept, Sam was out in the street opening his juggling case. He took out five pieces of fruit and started to juggle. Soon after, Ms. Del Rio approached from one direction, and Ms. Pennington approached from another. And just like that, Sam Wish was juggling in front of an audience, an audience of two. Sam packed the fruit back in his juggling case and ran down the street. He stopped near a near a stoop where a boy was sitting, and he started to juggle again. A moment later, Ms. Del Rio and Ms. Pennington caught back up to him, and just like that, Sam Wish was juggling in front of an audience, an audience of three. Again, Sam rushed down the street, and the small crowd followed. He stopped in front of Enzo's deli and began juggling again. Fruit was flying through the air when a customer stepped out the door. An audience of four! Finally, Enzo poked his head out the door of his deli to see what was going on. An audience of five. Chapter 6 By the time Eleanor made it to her bedroom window, Lucy was gone. So, with a bit of sausage from her breakfast still in her pocket, she set out to find her. She asked Enzo at the deli if he had seen a little white dog. He had not. She asked Bertolt at the butcher shop if he had seen a little white dog. He had not. She searched everywhere, from busy streets to empty back alleys, but Lucy was nowhere to be found. The sun was setting as she entered the park. A large crowd of people was laughing and clapping. <clears throat> Eleanor pushed her way through the crowd to find her father packing his juggling case. She asked if he had seen the little white dog. He had not. He's right there, behind the tree. Chapter 7. From deep within Eleanor's pocket, the faintest scent of sausage rose into the air. It drifted over a park bench, around a tree, and past Lucy's nose. She awakened with a jolt to see the little girl who fed her breakfast and her father. They were walking away. She followed them through the darkening streets. She lost them for a moment in a crowd gathered under a marquee, but picked up the scent again just in time to see them enter the back door of a theater. She waited and watched, and finally the door opened again. A man on stilts stepped out, and Lucy made her move. She dashed between the extra long legs and into the theater in a flash. Backstage, the Palace Theater was bustling with people and activities of every sort. But the girl and her father were nowhere in sight. Yet, the scent of sausage remained. Lucy pushed through a maze of velvet curtains and suddenly found herself at the edge of a stage. She did not see the girl anywhere, but she did see the girl's father. He was standing on the stage throwing fruit in the air. Chapter 8. Oranges, apples, and pears flew through the air in perfect order and finally came to rest in Sam's hand, one piece at a time. He took a bow. 
and there was a polite smattering of applause from the audience. Sam turned to his juggling case in search of something better, more exciting than fruit. He settled on the stuffed toys. He turned back to the audience, took a deep breath, and threw a stuffed toy bird into the air. Then he threw another bird, followed by a stuffed squirrel, and then another stuffed squirrel, and finally he threw a stuffed toy cat in the air. Suddenly, out of the corner of his eye, he saw a little dog charging toward him. It leaped through the air. In an instant, Sam was down on the ground, but he was still juggling. The little dog jumped in, onto his chest and then up into his flailing, sh then up to his flailing shins, leaping from one leg to another, snapping, barking at the toys circling above. But he was still juggling. Finally, the little dog snatched the toy cat out of the air. Sam, having now completely lost his bearings, watched as one by one the rest of the toys fell to the ground with soft thuds. Sam wished lay on the stage, expecting to hear the audience booing. He expected the hook to reach out and pull him from the stage, but it didn't. Instead, he heard applause. <coughs> Wild, thunderous applause. And the curtain swung close. Act Four. The next morning, Eleanor watched as her father juggled a brand new set of dishes. There was no rush. Lucy was not outside the stoop waiting for her breakfast. Lucy was right here next to Eleanor. As the dishes came to rest one at a time in Sam's hand, Eleanor applauded. Sam took a bow and Lucy stretched and yawned and curled up for a nap. And in her dreams, Lucy saw her new life. just exactly as it was.